So last week we were talking about Wilson and Versailles. Today, something about the aftermath, of one of the elements of Versailles, loss of China. This is Truman and the Three Mac attack. Today's story is about um, Harry S. Truman and Three Macs named McCarthy, McCarran, and MacArthur. It's also the story of the soft on communism Republican offensive of the late 1940s and early 1950s and of a president well into the 20th century wrestling among other woes with, the, with one of the aftermaths in any event, uh, the, the Versailles debacle which we discussed last week, namely the loss of China. Harry S. Truman was and still is a hero of mine. I vividly recall a picture of Truman with that broad Missouri grin on his face Waving a copy of the Chicago Daily Tribune, remember that? The head, uh, banner headline, Dewey defeats Truman. And still here is twangy voice mimicking H. B. Kaltenborn on election day. Went to sleep on the night of election. I virtually had to wake him up in order to tell me he was still president. Remember the letter um, he wrote on White House stationery to excoriating Paul Hume, the music critic of the Washington Post, who had panned Margaret's concert the night before. It started out, someday I hope to meet you. Uh, when that happens, you'll need a new nose. <laughs> That's the Harry Truman I loved, the most uncommon common man. There were no errors about Truman. Never forget where I came from or how I got here, he said, and where I'm going home to. He was not bashful about his humble origins. He said, my choice early in life, said Truman, was to be a politician or a piano player in a whorehouse. And to tell the truth, there's hardly any difference. <laughs> his mother, Martha Ellen Truman, God bless her, lived to be 100. She had a tart Missouri wit, a humorous uh, skepticism, a direct manner. She was not awed by the glory that had settled on her boy, Harry. Leaving Missouri for the inauguration as Vice President of the United States, what'd she say to him? She warned him, now you behave yourself up there, Harry. You just behave yourself. And historians have by and large been good to Harry Truman. He was a farm boy from Missouri, made good a man of the people, a man who could give him hell and didn't give a hoot about rank, social standing, even about generals of the army. Even five-star generals, why hometown boy Harry from Independence, Missouri, disobeyed his mother Martha, did misbehave. He fired a five-star general, survived. Tell about it. I fired MacArthur because he couldn't respect the authority of the President of the United States, said Truman. Not because he was an SOB, although he was one. <laughs> Actually, Truman's language is a bit more colorful. All these things I loved about Truman, and I wholeheartedly agree with biographer David McCullough, who wrote an absolutely magnificent biography of Truman. You ought to read it if you haven't. Concluded that as much as any president since Lincoln, Truman brought to the highest office the language and values of the common American people. But the fact that it is that upon close examination, and with just a couple of notable exceptions, Harry S. Truman was extremely unpopular during his two terms in office. Many of us who lived through his presidency tend to forget that. And this factor had consequences. I felt them, but more of that later on. The few notable exceptions, a few times when he was popular, uh, were during the months immediately after he was sworn in as president, where everybody was with him, following Roosevelt's death in uh, April 1945. Then November 1948, when he won re-election, but barely pulled the plurality of the, uh, of the, not a majority of the popular vote. And finally, for a brief period, 1951, as MacArthur, with the blessing of Truman and Secretary of State Dean Acheson, drove past the 38th parallel, advanced through North Korea toward the Chinese border at the Yalu River. Now, was before the Chinese communists attacked in force, nearly drove us out of Korea. During most of the rest of his two terms in office, Truman's poll ratings were abysmally low, a falling at one point in 1951 and 1952, below even those of Richard Nixon during the height of Watergate. 23% at one point. His alleged mistakes 
in office prompted the popular phrase, to err is Truman. Truman was a philosophical man about that, seemingly impervious to criticism. He said, you want a friend in Washington? Get a dog. <laughs> Despite his clerk-like appearance, Truman was fearless. The battlefront as a captain and the artillery during the First World War, he was voted by his men to be their lieutenant. They did that in those days. That's how they elected their lieutenants. The testament to his daunting leadership under fire. Ironically, the hero of one fierce battle, which Captain Truman survived in the Meuse-Argonne, was the Brigadier General Douglas MacArthur. Fate would conspire to cause their paths cross once again, decades later, far from the Meuse-Argonne. Truman had the misfortune of following in office Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was perhaps the most charismatic American leader of the 20th century. Life had been going along just swimmingly for Harry Truman. Before the 1944 presidential election, he had just enjoyed a very successful term in the Senate, where he had chaired a committee to investigate excess corruption in the production of war material. Although he was relatively unknown elsewhere, he was widely hailed in the Senate as a straight shooter who would abide no phonyism, no cronyism. This was widely understood, notwithstanding the fact that Truman was admittedly the protege of the infamous uh, Prendergast machine in Missouri. And his political mentor, Tom Prendergast, was now in jail. Remarkably, Truman was still fiercely loyal to the man who attended his funeral. Truman was uh, therefore a surprising choice as Roosevelt's vice president to replace Henry Wallace on the ticket. The other obvious choices were James Burns and Wallace himself. They'd been eliminated. Wallace, because he drifted very far to the left, developed a certain strange mystical trait. And Burns, because he was a Catholic who had converted to Episcopalianism. The Catholic vote was an important segment of FDR's Democratic coalition, which was, you'll remember, labor, the South, the Catholic vote. Burns from the South had, however, expressed Southern racial views. Truman came from a border state, never expressed racial views, had an exemplary record as head of the Senate committee. Labor votes were good. To some degree, seemed to represent the conservatives in the party. Just sort of dropped into the slot. The FDR hardly knew him. We can only surmise that FDR felt that FDR was immortal. Regrettably, his doctors did little to dissuade him from that illusion, although they must have known better. In fact, Truman had at first turned down the office of the vice presidency. On June 19, 1943, during the convention, he was summoned to the suite in Chicago's uh, Blackstone Hotel uh, by FDR's convention floor leader, a guy by the name of Bob Hannigan. FDR was on the phone, bellowed so loudly he could be heard across the room without a speakerphone. Bob, have you got that fellow lined up yet? No, said Hannigan. He's the contrarianest damn mule from Missouri that I ever dealt with. Well, tell a senator that if he wants to break up the Democratic Party in the middle of a war, that's his responsibility. With that, FDR banged down the phone. Truman was flabbergasted, floored. If that's the solution, he said, I guess I'll have to say yes. One night on the campaign trail, Truman woke up in a cold sweat, dreamed that FDR had died. Never really thought about it much before, aside from isolated incident, that one. Uh, Truman may uh, have been the only major Democratic politician who hadn't thought about it. But by April 1945, Truman was doing just fine in the office of vice president. Good greeter. Uh, he was enjoying all of the trappings of the vice presidency, including presiding over the Senate, which he loved, and late afternoon drinking sessions, libations, they called them, uh, with the boys in Sam Rayburn's private office. Uh, Truman, in fact, may have been the only major politician who actually enjoyed being vice president. On April 12, 1945, as was his custom every afternoon after chairing the Senate, Tr Truman retired uh, to Sam Rayburn's private hideaway on the ground floor of the house, unofficially known as the Board of Education. As he was mixing himself a drink, 
He was informed there was a call for him from Stephen Early, who was press secretary at the White House. Now, Harry, uh, come as quickly and as quietly as you can. That's all. Truman turned pale, ran down the hall between the bronze and marble Civil War generals, and through the echoing old crypt past the Senate barber shop, up the stairs and out onto the street. Only his driver met him. No secret service. I thought I was going to uh, meet the president, he would later say. Truman would not allow himself to think anything else. Perhaps FDR had come back from Warm Springs to attend the funeral of his close friend, the Episcopal Bishop of Arizona, uh, who had been buried that day. 5.25 p.m., two ushers uh, waited at the door of the White House. That was unusual. They escorted him via private elevator to the First Lady's sitting room where Eleanor Roosevelt greeted him with Steve Early and their daughter, her daughter, son-in-law, Anne and John Bettiger. Mrs. Roosevelt stepped forward and gently put her arm on Truman's shoulder. Harry, the president, is dead. Truman was dumbstruck. No! stood transfixed, unable to speak for what seemed an eternity. Finally, he managed, Mrs. Roosevelt, is there anything I can do for you? No, is there anything I can do for you, she replied, for you're the one in trouble now. <laughs> FDR's death came as a bombshell to Truman, just as it did to the rest of us. FDR had always been there, a larger-than-life father figure the whole, for the whole country. None of us ever thought of him as mortal. His first day in office, Truman said to the White House reporters, Boys, if you ever pray, pray for me now. I don't know whether you fellows have ever had a bale of hay fall on you. But when they told me yesterday what had happened, I felt like the moon, the stars, and all the planets had fallen on me. He frankly admitted he was scared to death. And all over the country, people were praying for him, but under their breath they were asking, who the hell is Truman? And so to the brutal attack of the three Max. Before Truman, the Republicans had had very little to take issue with. Roosevelt, a great time, wartime leader, had been nothing short of a god. Truman was anything but. But in 1945 and 1946, where our story of Truman and the Three Max begins, we find the Republicans searching desperately for issues. Soft on communism, an issue which had flourished before the war, had been silenced uh, after we entered the war on the side of the Soviet Union. But four months into Truman's presidency, the war was over. And within a year, the Soviets, who already dominated much of Eastern Europe, were now marching in Western Europe as well. Menacing, at least. The American public was growing uneasy. Winston Churchill, with Truman at his side, traveled to Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri, and uttered these unforgettable words. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended upon the continent. It was the unofficial start of the Cold War. The Republicans now began to allege that the New Deal was a leftist movement which is soft on communism, that it harbored treasonous fellow travelers, and that FDR had taken the nation into World War II, had sold out to Stalin at the 1945 Yalta Conference, and agreements abandoning Eastern Europe to the Soviet. Truman determined to preempt the issue by becoming the staunchest anti-communist of all. Some argue that Truman believed that he needed to keep the issue out of communism in responsible hands, democratic hands, out of those of partisan extremist Republicans. And using the issue, however, so the argument goes, Truman may actually have aided its legitimation and helped to make it the measure of international policy. And this is true, then did Truman's moves perhaps unwittingly aid the attack by the three max. The House on American Activities Committee, which had been launched in the 1930s, had been preempted by Representative Martin Dyes of Texas, who shifted its focus in the 30s and early 40s from pursuit of sympathizers of the Nazis uh, to pursuit of socialists and communists. 
Originally started by a fellow by the name of Dick Steen, the Lower East Side of New York, but he couldn't get it quite through in the 30s, so Martin Dyes preempted him. Dick Steen was after the Bund and similar organizations, but Dyes shifted the emphasis. Socialist, communist. But that committee had been rather quiescent uh, after we joined forces with the Soviets during the Second World War. But in the fall of 1945 and 1946, FDR was dead. The war was over, the shadow of the Soviet Union had begun to fall over Europe. Following in the footsteps of Martin Dyes, coalition Republicans, Southern Democrats established the House Committee on Un-American Activities, known as HUAC, it's an acronym. The Standing Committee of the 79th Congress in the fall of 1945. Truman was a fighter. 1947, he determined to preempt a HUAC investigation of alleged security breaches by establishing a federal loyalty program. Truman's program, ironically, became a precursor to Senator Pat McCarran's internal security legislation three years later. It required that all federal employees, as well as many others, such as academics applying for grants, uh, take loyalty oaths, whether or not they were involved in security matters. Created security files on all federal employees which the administration pledged would remain confidential, but unfortunately the list was eventually made available to the State Department and uh, two congressional investigators from the House Appropriations Subcommittee, headed by a man by the name of Robert Lee. Unfortunately, the files tended to reflect the biases and the prejudices of the security investigators who prepared them. There were ultimately only 57 names of persons still employed by the government on what came to be known as the Lee List. All 57 had been thoroughly investigated by the FBI. Nothing at all came of it. But the list would ultimately find its way into the hands of Senator Joseph McCarthy, who brandished it in the air when he had nothing but bluster to back up his charges. Truman came to regret opening these files to the congressional investigators and later denied them access. But it was too late. As his life neared its end, Truman admitted in hindsight the loyalty program had been a tragic mistake. Some contend that the success of McCarthyism was made possible by the dramatic changes that took place in the climate of American politics between 1945 and 1950. That these changes were in large measure the product of Truman administration's militantly anti-communist rhetoric with its stress on the need for confrontation with communism. The administration's conservative critics, the argument contends, were faithful to Truman's own assumptions uh, then when they denounced the Alta Conference, blamed the administration for losing China, and as MacArthur charged across the 38th parallel, demanded victory in Korea uh, and a march to the border of China. The Truman administration surely suffered under the uh, taint of the loss of China, a phenomenon which perhaps had its genesis in Wilson's capitulation to the machinations of the wily puppet master Kimochi Sianji at Versailles three decades earlier, which we talked about last week. The loss of China not only took its toll on the Truman administration, there were dire consequences a decade later, which we'll consider during our next sessions. Fear of communist penetration of our government, however, was an ugly new phenomenon. Suspicion of the State Department was rife. We were disturbed, we were bewildered by the new power of the Soviet Union. The rise of Mao's China and Chiang Kai-shek's flight to Taiwan in 1949 only compounded the problem and the fear. Truman's critics argue that he was an unwitting accomplice of McCarthy, that he could not control irrational anti-communism that his enemies used it to destroy his authority with the electorate. Truman's defenders claim that he did what he could to cap an irrational movement and that things would have been worse without his comparative restraint. Well, let's see. Two of Truman's greatest accomplishments, aside from NATO, were the Truman Doctrine that saved Greece and Turkey, the Marshall Plan that saved Western Europe. Both were necessary quite apart from the issue of communist military takeover. But the Truman administration had to work with a Congress that could not be easily persuaded 
to support giveaway programs. So Truman changed the rationale for the programs to control of communism. 1947, when Secretary of State George C. Marshall had first proposed his huge reconstruction package for post-war Europe at a Harvard commencement, he told his audience, our policy is not directed against the country or doctrine, but against um, hunger, not against any country, any doctrine, but against hunger, poverty, desperation, chaos. But when the Marshall Plan was enacted, the headlines in the New York Times read, aid bill signed by Truman as reply to foes of liberty. What had happened here? The whole nexus of the plan had changed. Why? Why the drastic change from the time the idea was introduced by Marshall at Harvard? After all, Europe was on the brink of economic collapse. Our natural trading partners and our foreign markets were in danger of disappearing. In post-war Western Europe, hunger and poverty were rampant. Now, there were severe shortages of food, commodities such as glass, I know. I was working in France in 1949 when a glass wine bottle was worth far more than the wine. We used to um, bring our empty wine bottles to the store, refill them there with wine from large red oak kegs. But Truman and Acheson downplayed the compelling economic rationale of the program, which might have been condemned as charity by the Republicans, and elevated the communist menace to the forefront as the rationale not only for domestic policy, uh, but for foreign policy as well. In the election of 1948, uh, Truman moved far to the right. He made the progressivism of third-party candidate Henry Wallace as important a campaign issue as did the GOP. It worked. He won. He was even ahead of the GOP in what became a barrage of accusation and counter-accusation against the left-leaning Wallace. But then, immediately following the election, the president began to lose his edge. For following the 1948 election, but on Truman's watch, two events occurred which significantly affected his ability to control the Republican sellout rhetoric and embolden the likes of McCarran and McCarthy. One, of course, was the Alger Hiss affair, and the other, we've discussed, the fall of China to the communists in 1949. Now, Alger Hiss's credentials were seemingly impeccable. Now, he had served as an advisor to Franklin and Roosevelt at the Alder Conference, was secretary of the Dumbarton Oaks, a conference which first drafted the Charter of the United Nations, serving as head of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. When Whitaker Chambers, a self-confessed former Communist Party member, that time an editor of Time Magazine, a senior editor, testified before HUAC that Hiss was a Communist Party member. Although an outraged Hiss appeared before the committee to rebut the charge, testified that he had never met Chambers in his life, and um, he had not been affiliated with any communist organization, uh, he was eventually convicted of perj perjury, and Hiss went to prison. It was, of course, HUAC's shining hour. Television was just beginning. It was all great TV drama and uh, it became the springboard for the meteoric rise of Richard Milhouse Nixon, the quintessential anti-communist poster boy of the 1950s. Ironically, it was the same Nixon who would ultimately open the door to a new era of relations with communist China two decades later. We'll explore this curious phenomenon in more depth in our coming sessions. The conviction of Hiss on January 21, 1950, unleashed a torrent of abuse on the Truman administration. Richard Nixon and Carl Munt now demanded that Truman ferret out those government employees with Soviet leanings. Wild accusations uh, abounded that Dean Acheson was working for Stalin. Russian agents were running loose throughout the country. And so the scene was set for the story of the first of our three Macs, Joseph McCarthy the progenitor of the politics of fear. During Joseph McCarthy's successful campaign in Wisconsin against Senator Robert La Follette, Jr., McCarthy had learned the technique of the big lie. He had campaigned as Tail Gunner Joe, a wounded veteran flyer. 
In so doing, McCarthy contrasted himself to Senator La Follette, who had not served at all. McCarthy, without a shred of evidence, charged that La Follette was guilty of war profiteering. McCarthy's military persona was a gross exaggeration. He was neither a tail gunner, nor was he wounded. The crew had jokingly nicknamed him tail gunner, uh, when as a prank he recklessly mounted the tail gun of a grounded aircraft and fired off its tail gun into the woods for a pretend target practice. McCarthy's wounds were primarily wounds to his libido uh, from a routine Father Neptune induction ceremony also performed as a joke by sailors on shipboard when it first crossed the equator. At a now infamous dinner in Washington's Colony Restaurant arranged by McCarthy to find an issue on which he could distinguish himself, one of his invitees asked McCarthy, how about communism and government as an issue? McCarthy pounced on the suggestion. The government's full of communists, he declared. The thing to do is to hammer them. Up to that point in his career, McCarthy had played no role whatsoever in the anti-communist crusade. A month later, however, he was on a plane to Wheeling, West Virginia, to appear before the Republican Women's Club on the occasion of Lincoln's birthday. It's not a particularly high profile audience, given his stature at the time, it was the best his staff could muster up. But the group and the speech would soon become front page headlines. Tucked away in McCarthy's briefcase were notes for a hastily assembled speech in which McCarthy alleged he had the list of 205 communists in government. In fact, the list had only 57 names, sound familiar, from the Lee list. But after his wheeling accusation of 205 had already made headlines, McCarthy now lied to the press and contended that he had mentioned a list of only 57. McCarthy knew that the operator of the radio station, the only one in wheeling at the time on his speech, had erased by mistake the entire speech. When challenged for the names, McCarthy cleverly maintained he was not at liberty to reveal it. He also took the opportunity to demand that Truman revoke the directive closing the loyalty files uh, to Congress and charge that Truman's failure to do so uh, simply label the Democratic Party the bedfellow of international communism. McCarthy had stumbled upon a political gold mine. He was about to assume leadership of a campaign that had been 10 years in the making, but up to that point, not by him. Truman, in attempting to interdict the Republican attack, had unwittingly abetted it by establishing the confidential loyalty files. And although Truman denied H. Huack the use of the files on the grounds of executive prerogative, it was too late. The House Committee had already used them in 1948. The cat was out of the bag. McCarthy had an issue. McCarthy had no evidence whatsoever of communists in government when he delivered his now infamous speech in Wheeling, West Virginia. Remember, the 57 had been cleared by the FBI. But McCarthy would soon learn how electrifying an issue this could become. Many of McCarthy's speeches were sheer fantasies, but the political fallout from them was very real. Congressional leaders began to fear McCarthy, and the Senate established a committee headed by uh, a venerable senator from Delaware named Millard Tidings, a very respected Democrat, to investigate McCarthy's charges. Opposing sides were now being drawn. Influential columnists such as uh, Westbrook Pegler, Fulton Lewis Jr., George Sikulski, lined up uh, behind McCarthy, as did the powerful Hearst organization. Hearst furnished McCarthy with a former staff director of the Dyes Committee. A wealthy industrialist, Alfred Kohlberg, a mysterious importer of Chinese textiles, a founder of the John Birch Society, a powerful lobbyist for National China, Nationalist China, had now funded McCarthy. Kohlberg was a persistent exponent of the thesis that the State Department had betrayed China uh, to the communists. This theme was readily espoused by McCarthy. Tail gunner Joe's career emerged from the shadows his star was now in the ascendancy. McCarthy's charges against Owen Lattimore, a Far Eastern uh, a scholar, Johns Hopkins, cloaked with congressional immunity, were eventually disproved in court. 
but Lattimore's distinguished career was in shambles, as were scores of others similarly accused by the tail, by the tail gunner. Senate committee headed by Millard Tidings accused McCarthy of having perpetrated a fraud and a hoax upon the Senate and the American people, but the denunciation would actually aid the rise of Joe McCarthy by elevating him to the role of embattled defender and the symbol of the communist in government issue. In the aftermath of the Hiss case and the fall of China to the communists, the Truman administration was highly vulnerable. Its popularity, which had never been high, was now at a very low ebb. McCarthy had struck a sensitive nerve. Communism and government became the major Republican campaign issue in the 1950 midterm elections. Miller Tidings, who led the charge against McCarthy, went down to defeat, along with many other prominent Democrats against whom McCarthy had also campaigned. The overall results of the election of November 1950 were devastating to the Democrats, disastrous. Tail Gunner Joe had emerged as a force to be feared. By 1950, there was a significant loss of confidence in the Truman administration. Aside from the loss of China and the Hiss affair, the conviction of the Rosenbergs as a successful explosion of an atom bomb by the Russians, and the conviction of William Remington, who was a member of the president's cabinet, would follow in rapid fire succession. Well, what then about our second MAC to attack Senator Pat McCarran of Nevada? In 1949, Pat McCarran inserted a provision in the State uh, and Defense Appropriations Bill that gave both departments the power to fire any employee as a security risk. Now, there was no right of appeal. As a result, people were now being fired left and right. Buoyed by his success, he followed by introducing the Subversive Activities Control Act of 1950 to contain so-called communist front organizations, a term never really defined. When the bill passed the Subversive Activities Control Board was established and empowered to determine whether an organization or an individual could be qualified as a so-called communist front. Although the determinations were in the main subjective, Failure of any such organization to register with the control board would subject it to drastic penalties, including prison terms for its officers. Overnight, we had fallen into an Orwellian trap. The nightmarish technique of guilt by association now infected our democratic system. An atmosphere was created in which persons, especially those in the academic and film communities, were afraid to form or join organizations to express themselves in public. What's the bottom line here? In the political climate fostered in part by the growing strength of our first Matt, Joe McCarthy, our second Matt, Pat McCarran, was actually able to pass through both houses of Congress an act which effectively discouraged the expression of ideas. They simply happened to incur the displeasure of a government-appointed thought control board. Think of it. It was the severest form of sedition law and blatantly unconstitutional. Truman vetoed the McCarran Act in 1950, calling it just that, a sedition law, comparing himself uh, to Jefferson, uh, who uh, uh, did away with the Alien and Sedition Acts in 1800. The fact that the act was then passed overwhelmingly over Truman's veto was a testament to the atmosphere of fear and hysteria in the country generated by the confluence of the Hiss case, the loss of China, and the machinations of our two Macs. The bulk of the McCarran Act was eventually ruled unconstitutional. But by that time, four million Americans had been screened. Uh, tentative charges had been brought against 9,000 individuals. 3,000 hearings had been held although only 378 persons were eventually denied employment or dismissed. The effect of the act, however, on the psyche of the electorate, of the electorate was devastating. Well, what then of our third MAC, General Douglas MacArthur? It was amid this atmosphere, paranoia, questioned loyalties, stifled speech generated by our first two MACs, that in June 1950, 
uh, Truman, having dinner at home in Independence, Missouri, was interrupted by a call from Dean Acheson. Acheson advised him the North Koreans had invaded South Korea. Truman's immediate reaction was to move quickly and drastically to intervene. Fortunately for Truman, no formal declaration of war was needed. Soviets had just conveniently walked out of the Security Council, so there was no possible uh, veto forthcoming. Truman and Acheson bypassed Congress, since technically we weren't declaring war, we were simply joining a United Nations police action. The battlefield leader in the Pacific was our third Mac, General Douglas MacArthur. Now, Truman was first very favorably inclined toward the general. They had been brothers in arms. MacArthur was the hero of the 1918 Battle of the Meuse-Argonne, uh, in which uh, Truman had also fought valiantly. Besides, MacArthur was a brilliant battlefield commander, first in his class at West Point from a distinguished military family, a great patriot uh, with a long and honorable history of service to our country, twice the recipient of the Distinguished Service Medal. The North Korean military swept south virtually unimpeded by a weak South Korean force. After a daring surprise landing by the UN forces under MacArthur at Incheon, halfway up the west coast of the uh, peninsula, our troops gained the initiative. After surrounding large portions of the North Korean force, they fought their way north past the 38th parallel into North Korea and were forging their way toward the Chinese border at the Yalu River. Truman and Acheson were related. At last, there was an administration counterweight to the soft on communism onslaught. But McCarthy, McCarran, they acceded to and even promoted MacArthur's fateful request to take the fight past the 38th parallel into North Korea to the Chinese border. They did so despite dire warnings by the Chinese that they would not tolerate a hostile presence on their border and notwithstanding the fact that the original aim of the police action was merely to restore the status quo before the attack on North Korea. In other words, the 38th parallel. The idea of the unification of Korea by Western powers was beguiling to Truman and Acheson, and American audacity in the field seemed to have been rewarded. Tragically, they had all dramatically underestimated the Chinese. Truman's popularity had never been higher than it became for the several months late in 1950, early 51, uh, as MacArthur, with Truman's blessing, drove north toward the Yalu. But a century replete with xenophobia, born of exploitation, humiliation of the open door policy, which we discussed last week, perceived betrayal by the West at Versailles, had generated a far more virulent Chinese form of communism than existed even in the Soviet Union. All of this pent up xenophobia and resentment, no doubt, lay behind the Chinese threat to intervene in the winter of 1950. The Chinese came streaming over the border, in numbers never even dreamed of by MacArthur, Truman, Acheson. Robotic frontline Chinese troops flung themselves fanatically on top of barbed wire as their comrades in arms ran over their prostrate bodies. Seemingly indifferent to casualties, they swarmed over and collapsed the UN forces. It was a form of warfare the UN troops had never encountered. The rest, the rout, was compounded by a rare tactical blunder by MacArthur, who had divided, unfortunately, uh, the 8th and 10th armies. The UN forces under General Walker were pushed back below the 38th parallel and again lost Seoul. The fierce Korean winter had now set in. Our troops were pushed back 300 miles. They were reeling, disarray, temperatures 25 degrees below zero. Casualties very heavy. Our retreat was being compared to that of Napoleon from Moscow in 1812. A frantic MacArthur now called for increasingly drastic countermeasures, including a naval blockade of China, importing Chinese nationalist troops from Formosa, and finally th dropping 30 to 50 nuclear bombs not only in Manchuria, but on mainland Chinese cities as well. Atomic bombs on Chinese cities. 
In these entreaties to bomb China, MacArthur had been joined by the Joint Chiefs of Staff. In an eerie foreshadowing of the executive versus military alignment JFK would face during the Cuban Missile Crisis a decade later, which we're going to explore next week. These were the worst moments in Truman's time in office. Remember that desk sign that he had, the buck stops here? The president alone bore the responsibility for what happened, and he alone would have to answer for it. At a meeting of the National Security Council on November 28th, Harry S. Truman, who once a citizen farmer from Missouri, Independence, made one of the most important decisions of his career and of our career. He would not accede to MacArthur and the Joint Chiefs. He would not escalate. He would not bomb China. He would not allow the Korean conflict to propel us into a third world war. Now Truman was an avid reader of history. He never went to college, but an avid reader of history. Convinced you know, that with both luck and personality play a major role in shaping our destiny. I concur. Lady Luck would finally shine on Truman when General Walker was in charge of the uh, uh, troops, now decimated and dispirited troops. The Eighth Army was killed in a Jeep accident in December 1950. General Matthew Ridgway replaced him. And here, Truman finally caught a break. For in a remarkable turn of events, Ridgway, a superb field commander, rallied the Eighth Army restored its fighting spirit, turned the tide of the war. By the end of March 1951, under Ridgway, the UN truce forces had retaken Seoul and were marching northward, but this time they wisely stopped at the 38th parallel. In March, buoyed by Matthew Ridgway's success in regaining the 38th parallel, Truman prepared to negotiate a ceasefire with the Chinese. But when MacArthur was apprised of the forthcoming presidential negotiation to end the war, he released his own unauthorized declaration, proclaimed victory in South Korea, described Chinese military capabilities as hopelessly inferior, threatened an expansion of the war to Manchuria and the Chinese mainland, and offered to meet the enemy commander to arrange an unconditional surrender. Truman is furious. MacArthur had purposely sabotaged the administration's peace plan. Dean Rusk, referring to MacArthur at this point, cited a famous uh, adage of Euripides, whom the giants will destroy, they first make mad. Truman bristled, but still did nothing. His reluctance to act was a testament to MacArthur's immense popularity. But when um, House Minority Leader Joe Martin read into the congressional record a letter from MacArthur calling for the establishment of a second front by the Chinese nationalists, Truman had finally had enough of MacArthur's flagrant attempts to usurp presidential authority. In April 1951, he fired MacArthur. Following MacArthur's departure from the scene, fighting eventually ceased and temporary tru truce lines were eventually uh, agreed upon in a large tent the 38th parallel at a place called Panmunjom. Permanent peace has not been entered into this day. Tragically, it's been estimated that Truman's decision to allow MacArthur uh, to strike on to the Yalu, despite repeated warnings of intervention by the communist Chinese, uh, cost over 30,000 American lives. It was a decision I am convinced was influenced in great part by Truman's fear of being outflanked by the Republicans on the soft on communism issue. It took decades uh, for a monument to finally be erected to the Korean War. It's been known as the Lost War. When in the spring of 1951, Truman finally fired MacArthur, he compared the situation to that Lincoln uh, faced in firing the recalcitrant General George McClellan in the Civil War. Lincoln had said the situation had reminded him, I love Lincoln stories, of a man who was mounting a nervous horse and when the excited horse kicked up, kicked up and stuck his hoof through a stirrup, man said to the horse, well, if you're going to get on, I'll get off. <laughs> In 
When Truman belatedly did fire MacArthur, the uproar at home testified to the fact that Truman had again fallen from grace. Richard Nixon called for MacArthur's immediate reinstatement. Senator Jenner of Indiana, joined now by the now powerful Joe McCarthy, called for Truman's impeachment. They declared the country was in the hands of a secret coterie directed by Russian spies. When Truman threw out the first ball at Griffith Stadium in Washington that April, he was booed. First time that had happened since Herbert Hoover threw out the ball in 31. Ironically, Senator Joseph McCarthy, an alcoholic, charged that Truman's decision had been influenced by bourbon and Benedictine. Truman had never uh, had that, never heard of it, that bizarre combination, even back in the good old days in the Board of Education room in the House. MacArthur returned to ticker tape parades and addressed before Congress national acclaim. His emotional refrain, old soldiers never die, they just fade away, now appeared everywhere in banners and bumper stickers. And although true to his word, MacArthur did, in fact, eventually fade away. The unfortunate residue of all of this was in 40, 51 and 52. The Truman administration was discredited both domestically and internationally. By 1951, after his disastrous seizure of the steel industry, Truman's popularity dipped to 23%. The Truman administration was essentially powerless uh, during the rest of its term. But buoyed by all of this, Joe McCarthy stepped up his attacks. The result was an unparalleled atmosphere of fear. People were afraid to sign petitions, to form or join any organization to speak their mind in public, to lecture in colleges, universities, to sermonize freely in churches and synagogues, to produce films, write books, articles, even to be seen in the company of people who did. Many were terrorized and becoming witnesses against colleagues, neighbors, relatives, friends, teachers. Professors were cowed into revising their lectures, even their assigned reading lists. They were fearful that what they said, even in private conversations, would be taped or repeated in the wrong places. Many were subpoenaed before the committee took the Fifth Amendment, were barred from their profession, blacklisted. It was an era not unlike that portrayed by Arthur Miller in The Crucible, as we slipped, almost without realizing it, down the slippery slope of 17th century Salem. Like the characters in The Crucible, Americans engage in a passion play of mystery, passion play of revelation, accusations of guilt, protestations of innocence. The guilt of the accused is often simply presumed, no matter the bona fides of the accuser. A guileful letter, whether or not it was pure fantasy, could uh, ruin the career of a public figure. It was all brought terrifyingly home to me early in September 1950. In the summer of 1950, I had been working uh, for the Cambridge Travel Agency as a tour guide in Europe between semesters at Harvard. I began research on what was to become an undergraduate thesis on the pitfalls of Marxist-Leninist ideology. I would focus on how that ideology had become the rationalization for the imposition of the brutal totalitarian regime of Stalin in Moscow. In Paris, I discovered the wonderful booksellers along the banks of the Seine. I needed original source material, texts of Karl Marx's original writings, those of Engels, Lenin, Hegel. Remarkably, the booksellers had many used copies in English and French, and they were available for a pittance. Most were inscribed with the names of students who had no doubt been forced to sell them, pay for their tuition or subsistence. Times were very bleak in post-war France. Well, this was a gold mine for me. So I write all over books. I write in the margins and the insides and inside of the front and back cover pages. I needed my own copies. So for the trip home, I jettisoned most of my packed clothes, giving them away to needy hotel employees keeping only a few days' supply of dirty socks and other dirty laundry. I filled my suitcases full of books, by and about Marx, Engels, Hengel, 
Hegel, Marxism, Leninism. Many had abstruse titles like Marx's essay on Feuerbach. But there were also incendiary titles such as Marx's Communist Manifesto. I never thought twice about such things as I packed. Now, I'd been out of touch with the United States since June, busied as I was with taking tourists on two so-called grand tours around Western Europe. There was no email then. Telephone communications were handled uh, through overseas operators on expensive, tedious process. I couldn't afford it. I had not called home all summer. There was no CNN. In fact, there was no television. In June 1950, while I was away, the Korean War had broken out. It was not going well for us that summer. McCarthy and McCarran were gaining great strength. Their attacks were becoming bolder now. During the summer, I had little time to read, and so I had saved a number of copies of the International Herald Tribune, other periodicals, promising myself that I would catch up with them and wall the world events on the long, long trip home. Paris, I boarded a plane, settled in, began to read. I continued to read as the propeller-driven constellation lumbered its way from one runway to another, from Paris to London, and to Shannon, Ireland, Reykjavik, Iceland, Gander, Newfoundland, stopping to refuel at every airport, finally on to Idlewild Airport, New York, which of course is now JFK. The longer the flight took and the more I read, the more I realized that the America to which I was returning had changed dramatically over the summer. At first, I was merely dismayed by the description of the McCarthy harangues, but as the flight grew longer, uh, the McCarthy attacks I read about became more vivid, more unrestrained. The initial backlash in the Senate against McCarthy's accusations had virtually ceased as the Korean War continued. Miller tidings faded from view. Other opponents had been cowed into silence. As for McCarthy, what had started in Wheeling, West Virginia as a blistering attack on alleged communists and government had rapidly evolved into a witch hunt threatening the academic community. I was now a part of that community. My dismay now began to turn to alarm. My God, the books in my luggage with names like Marxist Communist Manifesto were a ticking time bomb. I had to get them out of there. But I, had, I couldn't get off the plane and retrieve them at any of the four stops along the way. Not enough time, and if I offloaded my luggage, I would have to stay there. I didn't want to wind up in Iceland. I was due back in school the next week. Besides, I don't know anybody in Iceland. It's cold up there. But I did get off in Iceland with my luggage and discarded the books. How could I pay for a return trip home? My employer, the Cambridge Travel Agency, had arranged for just one space available flight back home. I was stuck. I would have to face the music at Idlewell. What would I say? How would I explain the books? By the time we reached Idlewild, I was in a state of panic. I never dreamed that thoughts such as I was having could ever have crossed my mind in the free country in which I was born and raised, in the free country that I had left in June. What if I inspected my luggage and found the Communist Manifesto? Would I be held at the airport, denied entry as a suspected subversive, hauled before a McCarran subversive thought control board, how could I explain to a customs or immigration official that despite carrying home a dog-eared copy of Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto, I was not a wild-eyed revolutionary, that I was in fact working on a thesis critical of communist ideology and supportive of it, but even the thought of making such an explanation was unworthy of me, unworthy of a free-thinking citizen in a free democratic society. I began to wonder, did accused professors or filmmakers have such unworthy thoughts. Was our country no longer free? Was our Bill of Rights in shreds? As I learned while crossing the ocean, careers were being shattered by mere innuendo. And so we landed. The plane touched down at Idlewild. I should have been elated. Home, home at last. Good old USA. But I was not elated. I shuddered. As I waited in the line at customs, I broke into a cold sweat. 
When my turn came, a huge, ruddy, uh, complexioned customs officer chose one of my bags, ordered me to open it. I recoiled. This was it. What would I say? Where was that damn communist manifesto? As I drew back the zipper, there were the dirty socks and the old underwear. And then, thank God, the obscure-sounding thesis on Feuerbach, sitting benignly on top. Buried somewhere out of sight was the dreaded manifesto. Would he, would he dig deeper? Thank God he didn't. Luckily, the agent never got that deep. Muttered something indistinct, zipped the bag up, marked it with chalk, stamped something or other on a piece of paper, passed me through. I guess the combination of my smelly old socks and stuff were sufficiently off-putting, or maybe the thesis on Feuerbach was simply above his pay grade. I don't know, but he passed me through. I quietly heaved a massive sigh of relief and began to decompress. Duly chastened, I rapidly exited customs. And Idlewild quickly hailed a cab, breathed free for the first time in 24 hours. When I reflect back on those times, I do so with horror, with dismay at the terror that political correctness and thought police, such as we endured during the McCarthy McCarran era, can quickly bring to a free polity such as our own. We all lived in part in a Gestapo-like atmosphere almost never before known in this country, and thank God, never since. And those who lived through it will never forget it. Many are still scarred by it, will never be the same. Perhaps a number of you here had similar experiences. Well, such then were the factors that brought our freedoms to the edge during the Truman administration. And for a short while thereafter, until under Eisenhower McCarthy finally went too far, he vented his attack on General George C. Marshall in the Army. He was ultimately denounced by the Senate following his disastrous performance during the Army hearings and a magnificent piece of lawyering, lawyering by a wonderful old Yankee curmudgeon named Joseph Welch. Fittingly, it was McCarthy's unrelenting malevolence that prompted these now famous lines from Joe Welch on live television to a vast national audience following an attack by McCarthy on a neophyte member of um, Welch's staff. Senator, until this moment, I think I never really gauged your cruelty or your recklessness. Little did I dream that you would be so reckless uh, and so cruel as to do injury to this lad. Your forgiveness, sir, will have to come from someone other than me. And then, have you left no sense of decency, sir, at long last? Have you left no sense of decency? And with that, the now sainted Joseph Welch, having stunned the country and awakened a long quiescent sense of decency in the American body politic, rose, walked out of the Senate hearing room to thundering applause, just as simply as that, tail gunner Joe McCarthy's career was essentially over. A Senate resolution condemning McCarthy passed in December 1954. And with the passage of the resolution, our first Mac, Joe McCarthy, not only passed out of the national limelight into obscurity, uh, he also went into severe physical decline. Alcoholism, which had plagued him throughout his career, finally did him in. Died less than three years later in 1957. He was 48 years old. By that time, our second Mac, Pat McCarran, had already passed into history, died three years before, in 1954. The very, very few portions of the McCarran Internal Security Act that were not ruled unconstitutional have not been enforced. Nevadans today, no idea who McCarran even was. Finally, after retiring from the Army, MacArthur, our third and final Mac, as he promised Congress, did in fact eventually fade away. Presidential ambitions soon came to naught. He spent the remainder of his life fading away in the Waldorf Towers on Park Avenue, New York City, writing his reminiscences, serving for a while as the chairman of the board of the Remington Rand Corporation, died in 1964. The great American patriot has remained 
an enigmatic and controversial figure ever since. Well, there's both a conclusion and an epilogue to today's stories. Historians certainly differ on whether Truman's anti-communism was on balance, good or bad for the country. Truman had indeed unwittingly uh, confirmed aspects of the Republican attack uh, by utilizing anti-communism as the rationale not only for foreign policy, but for domestic policy as well. Despite my admiration for Truman the man and for his many lasting accomplishments in battling communism uh, while in office, the Truman Plan, the Marshall Plan, NATO, rescuing South Korea, he simply could not control anti-communism the movement became irrational, got away from him. As he himself realized, his actions adopting loyalty oaths in an effort to preempt the issue and become the quintessential anti-communist, ironically only served to embolden his critics on the right. He may thus have unwittingly aided the legitimization of the issue. This then may well have helped to energize not only McCarthy and McCarran as well, of both of whom he loathed, and finally, by condoning Mark MacArthur's reckless drive past the 38th parallel into North Korea to the Chinese border, despite dire warnings from the woefully misunderstood and underestimated Chinese, Truman and Atchison cost countless American lives. The removal of MacArthur was a necessary and bold and courageous move, but regrettably destroyed the remainder of Truman's administration. But another residue of Truman's reign was that for the first and only time in our history, we had been brought into direct military conflict with communist China. It's a path on which we were initially launched by our mistakes at Versailles, which we discussed last week. It was a path of conflict which ironically was interdicted uh, by the staunchest anti-communist of all, Richard Nixon. More of that later in our fifth session. Finally, Truman's weakness in this regard, unfortunately, enabled an aura of hate and thought repression unparalleled in our history. It was a vital warning to us all to be forever vigilant, to guard against ever falling into such an Orwellian trap. So much for the conclusion. There's an epilogue. There's something about this story that's always haunted me. For sitting in the Senate, observing firsthand the consequences of the onslaught of the three Macs on Truman was a freshman senator from Texas. He had just been elected in 1948 by the infinitesimal margin of 87 votes in a statewide Texas election. In his second book on the Johnson tapes entitled Reaching for Glory, historian Michael Beschloss recounts how landslide Lyndon Johnson admitted on tape that he knew virtually from the outset that we could not possibly win in Vietnam. Yet he felt an unfathomable compulsion to drive on to rescue what he knew to be a failed and notoriously corrupt South Vietnamese regime. This compulsion which eventually drove Johnson to delusion, paranoia, and a nervous breakdown and doomed not only his presidency but a generation of young Americans, many of whom have never recovered. Why? Why this compulsion which cost the lives of so many Americans in the decades of the 60s and 70s and so plagued the conscience of our nation? We'll address this issue in depth when we consider the Johnson presidency weeks, two weeks from now. But I wonder whether the fear of being pegged as soft on communism had perhaps subliminally become an obsession with Johnson as well. Was Johnson then not unlike Truman in this regard, another Democrat who was impelled by this specter to grab hold of the anti-communist issue only to see it spin out of control. It's a chilling thought, but one I'll leave you with, leave you to ponder as we move on next week to the closest brush with total annihilation in our lifetime, the Cuban Missile Crisis, John Kennedy, Nikita Khrushchev, and an almost missed calculation. Thank you.